This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 19, Episode 6, filmed and released on November 20th, 2011, live from a frosty Pacific Northwest. My name is Chris. And my name is Alan. Hey, good morning, Alan. Welcome back to the big show. Yes. We have uh, quite a show today. Coming up, we're going to review in the second half of the show, OpenSUSE 12.1. And we're going to bring on another community member. And he's going to join us in the discussion, so look forward to that. In the news section, however, Barnes & Noble, we covered this at the beginning of the last week when the story just broke, that Barnes mm-hmm. & Noble was taking Microsoft to task for their anti-competitive behavior against Linux and open source in terms of locking down on people with these patent licensing deals. And, and, and specifically, which patents they were talking about. We've, right? we've been hearing details. about this forever. And yep. nobody, because of the crazy non-disclosure agreements that Microsoft made people sign, we could never find out what these patents were. Thanks to and Barnes & Noble, tells we, us, and we've got it, so we'll cover that in the news segment. As, and I'm, as we long expected, they're bogus. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, and I, can't, I think people are going to be just dumbfounded when they hear what they are. You won't believe it. Yeah. Also, uh, Desura, I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation. I think it's Desura, yeah. Desura, yeah. I got my hands on it this week because they have the official Linux client released. I'll talk mm-hmm. about that in the news section as well. Also, an Android and a universal Linux desktop pick that's going to help you get your life in order. Especially useful for the uh, holidays, maybe some shopping lists and things like that. So stay cool. tuned for that. But first, we have to say good morning to GoDaddy.com and the fine-looking folks over at GoDaddy.com. Good morning to Danica Pat- or Patrick. Danica Patrick. Yes. Patrick. I know. I know. I, I get that wrong all the time. And now, GoDaddy.com is the world's number one domain name registrar, and we have several codes you can use over there when you're checking out your fancy domain. Linux will save you 10% on checkout, and Linux 20, well, that saves you 20% on shared hosting. <laughs> Look at the chat room. The chat room saying good morning to Danica. I love that. <laughs> yep. I love the, I love the live stream. Um, so Linux 20 saves you 20% on shared hosting. Brace yourselves. Buckle up. Thanks to popular demand on the TechSnap show, on the TechSnap, mm-hmm. Alan. Uh, GoDaddy's hooking up Linux Action Show audience members with the code that's only going to last for a little while, I believe until the end of December, and that's yep. Linux 11. Linux 11 gets you $1.99 on economy hosting for three months. Hosting for three months, $1.99 a month. Can yep, you believe that's, that? That's a really low price. <laughs> that's, that's like, I don't know how that's possible, though. That's how low that is. So yeah. use Linux 11 to get that code. If you've got a project or something you've thought about kicking off the ground and you don't want to throw a lot of cash at it, you just want to experiment with something, this would be a great way to do it. Uh, for example, I'm going to talk about it later, uh, maybe next week, but uh, Gina Trapani of Lifehacker and um, mm-hmm. SmarterWare.org, she released ThinkUp, which is a really cool Twitter analyzation tool you get a ton of uh, really fascinating data out of twitter with this thing and you can graph and chart what people are doing and saying and how they respond but you have mm-hmm. to throw it on a box well this is a great example for dude yeah. for a dollar 99 just throw it a think but think up on a GoDaddy box and analyze your you know social stats and stuff like that it's oh. it's pretty cool so uh got to check out that it's code linux 11 to get that code and thanks to GoDaddy for their longtime support of the linux action show thank you all right Alan. Let's move on to my Linux, or actually, let's start with the Android pick, because it ties in perfectly with the uh, Linux desktop pick. Yep. And that is, now last week, I, I did cover a to-do list management program that I recommend people get, because it was one of the most beautiful Android apps I'd ever seen. And yep. I really mean that. However, it lacked a couple of really cool features for me, and the two that I need the most are good, solid group, group collaboration, where it's really dead simple to collaborate with a couple of different people, and also, I like to have a desktop client so that when I'm sitting at my computer, I can just bang in all the tasks in a nice, organized yep. manner. There's several w- different ways to do this, but one app that I like a lot, it's free, and it's called Wunderlist. And that's Wunderlist spelled with a W. <laughs> yes, because uh, uh, actually Angela recommended this one to me a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and so when you recommended Angela. a different yep. one, I was like, oh, now I'm going to have to compare them. Uh, so here's the difference. And, and I, so I kind of was, I was very sneaky when I did this because I, I, I have two different uses for Wunderlist and the one from last week. This one is more if, if desktop entering is a big deal for you. Now, you can accomplish that in the other one, but this one has a pretty nice application that's tied right into it. In fact, I'll just go ahead. and So my universal app this week is the desktop version of Wunderlist, and they have uh, 
clients for Mac OS X, Windows, iPad, iPhone, Android, and desktop Linux. And it, it works just like you'd expect. It, it's a nice sort of wood-grained interface thing that you can just enter tasks. You hit enter, it goes to the next line. You hit enter, it goes to the next line. One button, click to share this task list with somebody else. You just put their email address in, put share, and then it syncs between the handheld device and the, uh, and the desktop, which is really nice because in our house we've got an iPad, a Galaxy Tab, a Samsung Nexus S, and two desktops that we want to sync between. So it's really mm-hmm. nice that they all sync up. And so we've just been keeping like all the stuff we need to do for Jupiter Broadcasting in one window list. And, and I can even keep it up here on my machine when I'm hosting, and I can just, oh, if something comes up during a show, I'm like, oh, yeah, because, you know, often the chat room brings something up that I need to take care of, because yeah. they're always keeping me to task. Especially so I, uh, pre-show and post-show, eh? Yeah, exactly. And so I just bring this sucker up right here on the desktop. I enter it in, and it's just, it's already synced. And so that's Wunderlist, and, you know, again, I really like the fact that it ties in with both uh, a, a really solid, stable, low-resources app, uh, and and then also a really nice, quick and dirty uh, Linux desktop app as well. Mm-hmm. So that's a uh, Wunderlist, and uh, that's my pick for this week. Now I want to tell uh, tell you guys about the Runs Linux. I like to do this every episode. I pick one hardware device that you might not realize actually runs Linux underneath. We always focus on like the desktop end of Linux and how you know, like in the OpenSUSE twelve one review, we're really going to talk about how it works as a desktop platform or a server platform. Mm-hmm. But Linux is also even more widely used on these tiny little devices you'd never expect Linux to be running on. And this week's, I've heard about this device a few times, and Alan, you probably heard about this thing too. There's a big hubbub made that the creator of the iPod has redesigned the thermostat, and he's got this amazing-looking, cool thermostat. Have you, have you heard about any of this? It's been uh, going all over really TechCrunch and stuff. <laughs> Anyways, it turns out the, the creator of the iPod, who's making this new thermostat, built this thermostat to use Linux. This little tiny guy actually runs Linux, and that really kind of piqued my interest. And this guy's really going after, like, uh, the whole aesthetic appeal of thermostats, and he's mm-hmm. got, you know, metal trim and glass on the, on the dial, and I gotta admit, it does kind of look like a, a really cool thermostat. I know that's a funny thing to talk about. I'm showing pictures mm-hmm. if, you're not, if you're not watching the video version here. Um, it's a round, circular device. I don't really know how else to describe it. Uh, it looks like a hockey puck almost that's got glass and chrome on it, and mm-hmm. it runs Linux, and then it programs your house to keep you warm. That's cool, because, you know, sometimes you want to do something more complicated than your silly little old-fashioned thermostat can handle. And, of course, Linux goes great on that. Yeah. <clears throat> I could use a thermostat out here in this garage, because it's uh, 50 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit out here. It's, it's freezing cold. So, anyways, links to all of that in the show notes, as well as links to all of the previous desktop and Android app picks. If you'd like to grab those, just go over to the show notes and you can find them there. All right, Alan, what do you say? Let's do the news. All right, Alan. Yes. Our top story on the news docket this week was supplied by the Linux Action Show subreddit. So thanks to everyone over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com for submitting awesome links this week. All of the links in the show, uh, with the exception of one, were supplied by the Reddit, and the conversation mm-hmm. was always incredibly valuable. And it's a it great is. place to just get extra content that wouldn't necessarily make it into the show, but fits with the show's overall theme. So if you want more Linux Action Show, that's probably where you'll get it, because there's all kinds of mm-hmm. stories over there that you're going to want to read. Now, Let's talk about that Barnes & Noble exposing Microsoft yes. story, because that's probably the one I think is on everyone's top of their mind. Groklaw, of course, Groklaw, always providing yeah. excellent news coverage, really yeah. got their hands on the uh, Barnes & Noble legal filings, which is, oh, man, this is just so great. This is, I got to say, I'm not a big law guy. I really am not huge on law issues. But when you can get these, when these legal proceedings start to happen and, and, and companies request that information gets released and things like that, different parties have to disclose different information, mm-hmm. you get some really interesting things revealed that otherwise would have remained secret forever. And that's like the only yeah. thing I like about the law system and the law process. Well, well that's, and the law is kind of complicated, and that's why there's a website called Grok Law. Yeah, uh, if, yeah. If, if people don't know, in Unix and Linux, the word Grok means to understand. Right. So Grok Law is about You're it. changing this legal crap into something you can understand. And so on their website, you can see they have excerpts from the legal proceedings and then explanations of what it means or what's happening there and so on. Right. And it, it goes on to cover, you know, what Barnes & Noble is complaining about and, you know, the letters that they sent and 
It's interesting them. too because you go on to re- it reveals that this a lot of this has been playing under the scenes since 2005, and mm-hmm. and Barnes and Noble had a very active role in uh, raising concerns with Microsoft's um, patent a- acquisitions they got from both Nortel and Novell. And uh, in fact, in their legal filings, Barnes and Noble specifically said they were very concerned how it would impact Linux and open source software. Interesting to see Barnes and Noble. Um, bringing that concern up. Here's what, here's what they went on to say in their filings. They said that uh, Microsoft's assertions are trivial and invalid. These are direct quotes. Uh, mm-hmm. Shocking details about oppressive licensing um, ways of trying to control Barnes & Noble so that hardware and software design features that Microsoft said it had patented, they had control over their implementation in the final product. So much so that they would be limiting to a degree what Barnes & Noble could offer as upgrades or improved features to its customers had they signed the agreement with Microsoft. That's, yep. that's, that's appalling that they actually get involved well, at a product and feature level. They go, they go through to break down like every patent Microsoft claims they have coverage on and then Barnes & Noble invalidates every one of them. Let me, yeah, I'll cover, example, let me, here, I'll cover a couple of those. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, the, my, the most important one I think was here is the operating system provides tabs. Yes. or Microsoft's dude. claiming that in December 13th, uh, 1994, they gained a patent that said, you know, uh, a simple tool uh, that provide, provided by the operating system that allows people to switch between things uh, such as Windows. Yeah. Uh, and that was their patent. And Barnes & Noble is like, well, we got a programming guide from IBM in 1992 that discusses the same system and therefore prior art, your patent is invalid. Here's what Barnes & Noble's statement on that is. He said, the patents that Microsoft is asserting against Barnes & Noble do not even purport to cover hardware elements or basic software functions for mobile devices. And Microsoft has thus no right to require that designers adhere to any particular hardware or software specification in order to obtain a license for those patents. Yet Microsoft is doing just that, abusing and seeking to expand the scope of patents to control design elements over which Microsoft has no legitimate claim. Well, because the other part that's really getting to Barnes & Noble is because this is a tablet-like device, they're treating it as if all desktop computer patents apply to it, not just mobile patents. Right. right. Like, so they're basically you know, talking about the ability to switch multitask and so on, mm-hmm. or any UI elements that allow you to multitask, and, and Microsoft's trying to claim that they own that. Uh, the, uh, the other, I, there's a lot of patents in here too. Interesting. So Microsoft, when they were talking to, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, makes claims about having over 60,000 patents at their disposal. Then when it actually got down time to say, Hey, we're going to sue you. We're going to sue you over six patents. That was like, Oh, okay. Wow. Well, that's unbelievable. And then when they actually got sued, they only sued them over five patents. They whittled it down from five patents, all of which, all of which. Barnes and Noble clearly identifies as invalid. They they yeah. literally uh, yeah. So here's you know, here's a couple of them: web browser background image loading. This is one of the patents that Microsoft has against the Barnes and Noble Nook. Web browser background image loading. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, operating system provides tabs. You mentioned that one. Electronic selection with handles. So that means like grabbing the handle in the bottom corner of the window to resize it. Yeah. Yeah. Microsoft uh, trying to claim they own that. Annotation of electronic documents. Web browser loading status icons. Yeah, so they're trying to say they patented the idea of uh, some kind of status indicating that something is loading. How does that even make any sense? Who gives them these patents? And this is what they're going up against Barnes & Noble for the Nook against. Yeah, they're trying to say, you have to pay us all this money for your Nook because you have a web browser loading status icon. Un- and we own that idea. Unbelievable. They also go on to raise concerns with Microsoft's anti-competitive agreement with Nokia, saying mm-hmm. that in their uh, new deal with Nokia to uh, become the premier Windows platform provider, they say not only is it an anti-competitive move to just buy Symbian out of the market because they're, re- they're swapping out Symbian with Windows Phone, so Microsoft's yeah. approach is to just buy out market share, but also there are some pretty significant patent agreements in there and also commitments in the agreements from both companies to vigorously defend their patent portfolios together. Right. So basically, it is literally like countries that have mutual defense packs. Yeah. Saying that if, if Microsoft goes to sue somebody, Nokia is going to jump on and help sue. This, uh, this, and it's definitely anti-competitive. This is such a clear abuse of anti-competitive behavior. When you actually get to hear the patents they're going after Barnes & Noble with? I mean, 
the image loading in there. a web browser in the background? Are you kidding me? How, as if there's some other way to load an image into a web browser. <laughs> Resizing a window? I mean, you guys didn't even invent but, that metaphor like, to begin with. That's what I love about Microsoft. There's a ton of the stuff they have patented they didn't even create. You know, no, that's it's what's like, so beautiful. Well, the, like the web browser one. It says right here in the comments, it cannot reasonably be disputed that web browsers included status uh, loading indicators before the patent was filed. Yeah. Because this is long after the invention of the web browser. It's yeah. like the, they were just granted these patents because they were Microsoft and because people at the patent office in 1997 didn't know what a web browser was. I feel like I want to get in my truck and just pack a big lunch and drive to wherever Barnes & Noble's headquarters is and just go down there and high five every single one of those guys in that office because what they are doing is so critical to the future growth of these open mobile platforms. I, I mean, if Microsoft were to successfully litigate Android into this kludge where people aren't going to want to use it, then that really leaves Windows, OS, and iOS. And I don't think that'll happen, but it's at least going to slow things down and hinder innovation. Yeah. So well, nothing else, Barnes & Noble is helping out that we've way. We've seen this stuff happen before where an idea gets caught up in legal yeah. trap and it, it dies off when it might have been the better solution. Boy, isn't that <coughs> true. BSD and I think Linux. also... <coughs> <coughs> Yeah, well, yeah. I if think also, I hadn't got sued, then yeah. But anyway, I, I also think that, uh, and I know people might disagree with this assertion, but I think the Stow, the Stow suit against uh, against Linux way mm -hmm. back in the day, I think that hindered a lot Linux? of corporate yep. adoption because when I was in the banking field, that was right when the Sco lawsuit thing was going on, and the bank I was working for had a major Linux virtualization thing we were going to try. We were really ahead of the curve because they were looking into virtualization really early on for uh, right. for disaster recovery purposes. And they were really considering going with a Linux Red Hat platform, and the uh, chief technology officer of the bank put the kibosh on it because of the SCO lawsuit. Yeah. So I got to figure that happened other places too. So For even sure. just raising doubt around a product makes other companies that are risk adverse want to avoid using open source. So mm -hmm. what Barnes and Noble is doing here is saying, look how look how trivial these are. Look what they're doing here, people. They don't have. A smoking gun. Well, maybe they do. Maybe the ones that are just flaunting to Barnes and Noble are the crappy ones, for all we know. But it seems like, it seems like after all this litigation, and this has been going on and building since two thousand and five, my bet is this is the real deal. Yep. And hopefully this gets quashed, and we never hear about this again. But you know, we, Microsoft's yeah. going to keep trying. Uh, but hopefully we can continue to invalidate and maybe whittle down those 60,000 patents to a couple of reasonable ones mm -hmm. where they might have actually come up with something innovative. But so many of them, it's just like, how did nobody do the due diligence to say, sorry, there was prior art on that. This has already been invented by somebody else. You can't claim it. I don't think they take that burden on. I think because of the, how busy the patent office is, they say, well, well no, we'll the, just wait. The, I, it shouldn't the burden be on the lawyers that are filing for the patent in the first place. And there should be some kind of penalty if you file for a patent and it can be invalidated. Oh, amen, brother. It's, you know. Amen to that. I, uh, I, I, you know, the patent office all of a sudden would go after these type of things if the patent office got paid every time somebody's patent got invalidated. That's a great way to go. That's maybe how the patent office could raise its budget and get more people hired is by fining. I mean, I, all right. Yeah. Should we talk about uh, ice cream sandwich? Yes. So good, good, good news. Not yes. only this week did we get ice cream sandwich, but as a result of releasing the entire source tree, we actually got honeycomb, which if you remember, honeycomb up until this point, had been the had been sort of the stepchild version of Android that had never been released to yeah. the community. Yeah. So uh, JBQ, who uh, some of you may know, uh, posted over on the Android um, mailing list uh, and discussion group, and I love how casual he is about it. He says, "Hi, we've just released a bit of code. We thought this group might be interested in." <laughs> <laughs> Which that bit of code is Being two of releases honeycomb. of Android. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, yeah. you know, you might be, you all might just like this. Uh, anyways, one of the other things that was uh, kind of funny is he goes on, he says, this release includes the full history of the Android source code tree, which naturally includes all the source code for Honeycomb releases. However, since Honeycomb was a little incomplete, which, what does that mean? Uh, we want everyone to focus on ice cream sandwich. So right. we haven't created any tags that correspond to the Honeycomb release for like making it easy to build and things like that. Right, so they um, don't have all the different uh, version tags. Normally, right. like each release would be a tag so you can see what was different in each release. And instead, they just kind of lumped all the Honeycomb in there being like, just ignore that, and here's Ice Cream Sandwich. H honeycomb must just be a real stinker. Well, th that, they kept saying that's why they didn't want to release the source code for it. But... Yeah, yeah. 
Maybe so. Maybe so. Chat room, you know, I always wonder too, because the chat room sometimes feels like covering Android isn't a very Linuxy thing. I, I gotta, I gotta disagree though now, because at this in this point, case, with the actual yeah source code actually in hand again, and the fact that people can now take it and do things with it. I think it definitely brings it back to where we yeah. wanted it to be. You know, and then you also get in the definition of what makes something a Linux device. Is it just the kernel, or does it need the GNU user land, too, to be a Linux device? What, what makes it a Linux device? And, and is it, if it's code written by Linus in something called the Linux kernel, that seems like it's a Linux device to me. No. If they swap the kernel out for a BSD kernel, then I would say Android is a BSD device, right? No. I don't know. Uh, no, the chat room says they like it, so they say it's okay. Uh, anyway, no. so well, it, there's, I think there's enough Linux left under there that you could get at it if you wanted to do well, something. Well, you know, that is true, because like when, I've, when I've rooted my devices and stuff like that, I'm busting out old commands that I've used for years. So uh, another mobile device that's popular this week got its source code released by Amazon. The Amazon yeah. Kindle Fire had its code released. Now, uh, boy, I should put a link to this guy in the show notes, because if you're thinking about picking one of these up, uh, I think the uh, Amazon affiliate deal gives us extra monies if you buy a Kindle through our affiliate link. So uh, I haven't gotten my hands on the Kindle Fire, but I got to say, if I was in the market to buy a tablet, I'm not because I'm poor, but if I was, I think I'd go for the Kindle Fire. I think I like, yep. I like what it's bringing. I really do. Some I have a have regular complained. Kindle because I wanted it for reading, not so much for a tablet, but uh, if I wanted both, the Kindle Fire is definitely appealing. Yep, exactly. And uh, so it's cool to see them releasing the source code Maybe some improvements they've made there will make its way back into mainline Android. Wouldn't that be interesting? Now, another little embedded Linux box, a, a lot of uh, Linux embedded news this week is uh, getting an update, and that is the Boxy Box. I think we've talked about this a couple of times on the show before. Alan, have I ever talked to you about the Boxy Box before? Uh, not really, no. Okay, all right. Well, um, the Boxy Box is, in my opinion, the creme de la creme of little media streamers. It's not absolutely perfect. It has some. It has some. It has some issues. Sometimes it has some quirks, though. Really, they keep improving it. Uh, but it is a Linux-powered little device, and uh, it it runs on a. Uh, I guess it must be like an Atom processor or something, and it runs cool and silent, and plays just about every format in the world. Has Netflix streaming, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I really love the Boxy Box. I've bought two of them. It comes with this great little remote that you can flip over, and it has a full QWERTY keyboard. It's like the size of an Apple TV remote, only uh -huh. on the other side, it's got a full-sized, real-deal keyboard. Anyways, this little Linux-powered box is getting live TV support pretty soon. So if you're a true cable cutter, which I have, I don't have, I don't have cable TV service or satellite TV service. Me either. You use this Boxy Box is perfect because it works with Netflix, and there's not, you know. There's not a lot outside of Netflix that I need. So when I can supplement that with downloads, dude, the boxy box gets it. But where, where you still miss out when you've cut the cord is like live presidential debates or when it snows around here. I like to kind of watch the news to get the road reports and stuff like that. All of that's transmitted over the air in HD just for free. All you need is the antenna. So they're making this little USB dongle that you'll be able to pick up and you plug into it. And then on the other end, you hook up an antenna. And then, yeah, it's actually going to bring in live TV to the Boxy Box. It'll only, this device will only work with the Boxy Box, and it's not going to work with the Boxy desktop software, for like Linux desktop, unfortunately. But uh, if, if you needed like a spouse-approved Media Center device that you could just plug in, and it does HDMI out, and it will play all your formats from a Samba share or whatever, this is a great way to go. I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to pick one up, because you can support the show. The live TV feature isn't available yet, but it is available for pre-order. Which, uh, hopefully, you know, you get it now, you get it in times for, like, the elections and, and maybe snow reports and stuff like that. Right. Uh, does the Boxy Box, can it do the Jupiter Broadcasting live stream? Yes. In fact, we even had a uh, <clears throat> Jupiter Broadcasting app made uh, for us, but Boxy Box changed how they wanted apps done, how they wanted mm -hmm. them submitted. It was just a, it was essentially an RSS parser that then broke out all of our shows, and then you could just pull up any show on demand on the Boxy Box. And they said, ah, no, we want apps to be shinier now and have more flash. after they. After they, not like Flash Flash, but like, you know, whiz -bang Flash. After they accepted hundreds of apps like that, they cut the line off at the Jupiter Broadcasting app. And so we're not in there. But it will, so it will play, it'll play Flash video and it will play RTSP streams as well, like our live stream is now. So right. it will do it. So if I ever get a BoxyBox app back in there, I would love to put the live stream on there because then people could watch the Linux Action Show live. Yep. Which you can now do on your Roku, though. The Roku app has been updated, is, I'm pretty sure, anyway. There's oh, a no beta kidding. of it anyway to watch the live stream on your Roku. Now, I know I mentioned at the top of the show that we're using the Scale Engine stream now. 
But what that means for Linux Action Show viewers is you can watch it in like VLC or M player outside of Flash. So if you're a yeah. purist and you don't have Flash on your Linux desktop, well, for one, I salute you. It must be really annoying. And two, you don't have to use Flash now to watch this live. Yes, there's little, little links under the uh, live player on jblive.tv for uh, there's a VLC playlist with all the settings in it or a raw RTSP stream but you'll want to set caching yourself on that one. Mm -hmm. There's also a link there for mobile devices. As yes, well. uh, there's one for the iPhone uh, HTTP live streaming, which works on the Roku iPhone. Uh, and gingerbread. Some, uh, some gingerbread devices. The RTSP link works as far back as uh, Froyo, though, as well. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so let's talk about Desura. I'm not quite sure on the pronunciation yep. of it, but if you know Steam, you kind of get what Desura is about, only they've officially released their client for Linux. It's been out for a couple of weeks, so it's not completely new, but it's been what they're calling unlocked for all Linux gamers. So you can go grab Desura, and they have, I believe it's 63 different Linux games on demand. I have a link to their games catalog that you can check out. It's a free, it's a free client, just like it is under Steam, and the browsing experience is very familiar, very much like Steam. I've used it a little bit. I've had a couple troubles downloading games, but nothing major. And uh, I've heard of a couple other people have reports, but the chat room says it's been working great for them. And uh, this, to me, is extremely extremely exciting it's a yep. a well-done implementation of a steam-like um, service b native linux support and they have a windows client but c they do something that i think is such a perfect fit with the kind of indie market vibe they have going and they call that alpha funding this could be this could be really big for open source gamers alpha funding lets you sell a game a sort of like a pre-sale think like it's kind of like a kickstarter and they call it support, they, what they say is support kick-ass upcoming games by crowdfunding, crowdfunding their release. Get instant access to rewards in the form of frequent alpha updates. So you get, you get the game as is in alpha and it's in beta. And then once it's out, I assume you would own the game. That and is kind of the model that was invented by uh, Minecraft, right? Minecraft sold like 50 million copies and it came out like yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, the final version like just came out. Yeah, yeah, kind of. You're right. Yeah. So that's but so but what what Desura lets is is anyone can submit their app for the alpha funding thing. And right. man, it, a, a great games delivery platform for Linux that could support people to to develop games, Actually make Linux games exactly. And this and since Desura sells on on Windows, and it sounds like they're making a Mac client as well, you could potentially be opening your game up to a huge audience. Man, yeah, because the. That's the main difference. When you make a game for Linux, it's usually pretty easy to make it run on Windows and Mac as well. Yeah. Whereas if you make it on Windows, it's usually pretty hard to make it go about the other way. So I, uh, I played with Desura a bit in my OpenSUSE box, and I downloaded Alien Arena, which they had. They have a couple of free games in there for Linux. I'm showing, a clips, I'm showing clips of it right now, and it looks very much like Steam, but I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think that's a, mm. I actually like the way Steam's laid out, so I think this works pretty well. Um, the, uh, the game, like I mentioned, never, the one game never did finish downloading for me, Alien Arena, but I also downloaded another free game without issue, so I'm not really too concerned about it. It might have just been because I was using it during a, uh, kind of a, a popular time. Anyways, right. uh, links to that in the show notes. It also does that feature that I like where you can, you can, you can purchase a game and have it download, and then you can continue to go shop while it downloads in the background. Which, uh, right. is my favorite thing to do, because then I can just keep going. <laughs> I can just shop and shop. All right, Alan, the uh, last story on the mm -hmm. news docket was submitted by our very own Alan, and it's Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. Chase got milk patents? Yes. So basically, uh, all four companies, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, have been granted patents uh, for uh, these, the same technology, basically. Uh, they each describe it in a different way and give it a, a very different title surprise, so that surprise. it doesn't look like it's the same thing. But all of them are basically... Uh, when you make your wonder list that says get milk, yeah, uh, it, it, you, you mark that with like the store. And so when you walk into the grocery store, your phone vibrates and is like, hey, you need milk. So instead of reminding you whenever, it reminds you when you're at the store or when you're near the store. That way, it has more context and it's right, useful. Yeah. And sure, but A, I don't think any of those four companies invented this idea. Right. Uh, I don't think it's a very novel idea. I agree. It's a great feature, but yeah, and all four of them didn't invent it at the same time. Well, and who's shipping it besides Apple? I mean, isn't Apple right. the only one shipping location-aware reminders? I mean, I have it working on Android using um, various different apps that you can try, but uh, I just, 
I don't I don't know anything that Microsoft shipping that does this. And I'm so sick and tired of Microsoft patenting crap that they don't ship. Yeah. Well, all four companies have been granted patents for it. Uh, and it basically shows that nobody's monitoring and actually approving these patents. And it's interesting to see Amazon on that list, huh? Amazon's yeah. becoming more and more of a player in this space with the with well, the Android well, they, market and the Kindle no, they Fire. Did, remember, they did also their uh, universal uh, wish list app uh, for mm-hmm. your phone, or, and mm-hmm. it's a browser mm-hmm. plugin and stuff. That's and right. so you can you can add stuff to your Amazon wish list from other websites. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think yeah, they're definitely uh, moving into this space. And they, but you know, Amazon, it makes more sense for Amazon to be dealing with your shopping list than Apple, Microsoft, or Google, I think. I totally agree. Yeah. It does seem like I've had anybody you know, that would deserve that patent. Well, I just, I hate, also, I hate uh, these patents. You know, milk and bread and eggs are like the only things you don't buy at Amazon. <laughs> that's that's for, for me especially true, too. I mean, yeah. once I got Prime, I was like, oh, well, now I'm just buying everything from you guys. Yeah. And I, th- you're right. I would buy groceries from Amazon. if I. In fact, there is an Amazon Fresh service that I think will soon be delivering to my area. So watch out, grocery store. Yeah, it's horrible. All right, Alan. Well, that's all the news for this week. And it's time for the Linux Action Show to take our action lens wah, 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 and point it at OpenSUSE 12.1. Now, we were going to have Matt join us from uh, the community, but he had some Skype issues. He'll probably come and join us in studio in, in a, on a future uh, episode, so no worries there. We'll get a chance to pick his brain, and maybe uh, he can tell us his thoughts on OpenSUSE 12.1 when he joins us then. So, mm-hmm. with that said, one more mea culpa. I'm, I apologize about this. I think that's the right use of the term. Uh, my VM isn't working that I would normally show you OpenSUSE 12.1 in. So I will explain to you the uh, my review environment was consisted of several VMs and also my HP MV, like I used last last week for Fedora, my HP MV17. And I had OpenSUSE on there, and I tried it with the GNOME 3.2 desktop, with the KDE Plasma Workspace desktop, with LXDE and XFCE. And that's one of the great things about OpenSUSE is they really have support for all of those desktops out of the box, yep. which is really cool. And and I'm I'm a, I'm kind of getting more and more of a fan of trying out alternative desktops. So the timing with that was perfect for me. Yeah. Now, uh, all right. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what everyone's favorite feature of this release will be, but I'll tell you. I'm going to go ahead and jump to one of mine. And Alan, you and I have talked a lot recently about ZFS, and one of ZFS's ni- nice features is is like snapshot abilities, right? Yep. And. I've, I've, I've wanted something like this under Linux, and there's utilities you can use that will essentially accomplish this. But one of the nice things that uh, ButterFS, which we've talked about a while ago on the show, supports is the snapshot functionality. But until OpenSUSE 12.1 came around, I've never seen a great tool to manage file system snapshots. So OpenSUSE 12.1 has introduced something, one of the greatest features I think that uh, they've had in a while, and it's called... Snapper overview. And you can go into Yast. If you remember, Yast is this great management area in OpenSUSE that has just continued to get better forever. And uh, you can actually go and review previously deleted and changed files on the file system, select them, and restore them, which is Uh really nice, like config files. The other thing it'll do is it'll tie in with the package manager zipper, and you can actually use this to restore from bad installs and stuff like that by reverting changes right, so made. Right, if you, so if you upgrade a package and it doesn't go well, you can snap back to what the package was before. Yes, yes, and it's really slick. It's how got, does that affect the performance since everything's copy on write? Well, they don't really say how it works exactly, I didn't, and I didn't dig into it, but they say they use a, a method that's very resource um, fair. Like it's, it's very conscientious of that, and I think it uses a notifier system so that when... Uh, when when the file system writes something to the, di- to the disk, it notifies the kernel, and the kernel does the message handling from the right. file system driver to whatever applications might be listening to let them know. I, at least that's my kind of really layman's understanding. Yeah. I apologize if I butchered that, but that means that really they can kind of queue it up in the sense that the mm-hmm. kernel can just kind of keep a list of changed files, and then when file system activity dies down, it can execute all of those at once and not impact performance. It's kind of my right, rough understanding of that. Kind of how ZFS does it as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's Snapper built into Yast. You do have to kind of select it, but um, it's not that hard. Now, uh, Yast is Yast is really one of the standout features of OpenSUSE. And I'm showing on the video version here the installation of OpenSUSE 12.1. This is itself a, a version of the Yast tool. 
So even at the very beginning of using OpenSUSE, you're immediately using Yast. And this tool is available in text mode. It's available in a GUI mode. It works in Qt. It works in GTK. Uh, and it's, it's one of, I think, the best Linux distro installs uh, out there. The screen mm. it's at right now is sort of like this last summary screen that OpenSUSE gives you. And it says, all right, I'm going to create these partitions. I'm going to set these boot parameters. And then I'm going to install these software packages. And you can click on any major title there and change the parameters before it blasts it to your disk. Right. It's, and that's something a lot of people were complaining about, especially with Fedora, where they didn't realize it was going to do this or that or the other thing as part of the install. And so yeah. letting you know before it does it is very nice and it strikes this balance between and if you watch the video here it's just the the video is just you know you could just click 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 right through and really right. never slow down or just from like one click away you can really get into the depths and it's it's done in a way where it understands and appreciates if you're a power user but it doesn't blow you away if you're a total novice so if it's the first time exactly. you've ever seen it you could probably stumble your way around in there the yeah, other thing Oh, go ahead. Follow the process. You can just follow the process through, but if you need to change something, you can. They don't bury the functionality or make you use you know, some other installer to be able to like, customize it. The other thing I love a lot is it has really intelligent partition management, and I am really impressed by this. Every distro does this now where you know, they'll detect your windows. in. Well, pretty much every distro will detect your installs and, and recommend mount points and stuff like this. But in OpenSUSE, if you want to use ButterFS to get advantage of the file system snapshotting and also some of the trim features that ButterFS supports for SSD, you just you have all your partitions laid out. And OpenSUSE is like, okay, here's what we recommend. Here's what we're going to do with your Windows partitions. We're going to mount them here to this, to this spot. Here's your home directory. You click Use ButterFS. And within just a few seconds, it completely recalculates the partition map layout, and it, and it, it creates volumes. It, it creates ButterFS volumes. I mean, it's just, in, it's just beautifully and elegantly just... In one, in one brief click, reformulates the entire drive partitioning in a way that I would have done if I was doing it manually. Like, you know, it breaks right. out home, it breaks out slash var, and I didn't have to really do anything at all. And I've tried it on various different drive setups, and it's worked great. I'm mean, really impressed with it. Nice. All right. So that's, that's the ButterFS support. Uh, there's something else that is my absolute, absolute most anticipated feature of OpenSUSE 12.1, and that's Tumbleweed. Now, you might remember we talked about Tumbleweed in the last review of OpenSUSE because they had preliminary support for it. In SUSE 12.1, Tumbleweed is finalized. And what Tumbleweed is, is an always rolling release repository. Think like Arch here or like Debian. No, is it unstable? Uh, the release of the OS or just of the packages? Everything. Okay. Because everything kind of comes down to a package level, right? I mean, the kernel's a package, right. Grub's a package. So they're just revving all of the packages. You can subscribe to that. And then you are now. Your OpenSUSE has just become a rolling release by really a pretty elegant swapping of some repositories and checking a few boxes, and you're done. They've right. actually got they've got a command that you could just copy and paste right here on the on the on the uh, like the release notes. Mm -hmm. You copy and paste that into your terminal, supply your root password, and it's just changed your distro to a rolling release. Nice. That is really nice, and uh, they on top of that they've got a, gr a bunch of great community repos out there. But you know how. You know how I kind of got on Fedora for their lack of codec support and how they didn't really help handle playing a media file very elegantly when I was missing the H.264 decoder? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, OpenSUSE isn't much better. And I think that's kind of disappointing because to me in this stage, media playback on such a, a nice desktop is really shouldn't mm -hmm. be challenging. Now, it's not as bad as Fedora's, it can work, it'll walk you through the steps and you do end up having to, to get like some of the other codecs. You do have to go and add a repo, but they actually, they give you just one click on their webpage to just click the repo and then it adds it to the software manager and refreshes and then you just check a box and you have it. And the other thing, they, they handle Flash kind of elegantly, like when you install your system updates after you do like the update of the update manager, one of the next available updates comes along is the little thing that lets you install Flash into your browser. So they're like, well, we know you probably want that, but because of legal reasons, we can't distribute it directly. But here, we can distribute it this way. And then it's just, you know, once you're doing your updates, it's just a checkbox to get Flash. So mm. in one sense, they handle that pretty well. But then when it came time to get H.264, I still felt like for a new user, they'd be kind of lost, you know, going to get a repo and that kind of stuff. And I really, I don't, I didn't get the sense in this case that it was bigotry, that OpenSUSE just felt like it was immoral for them to use those codecs. So they made it hard intentionally. I just felt like it was, this is a, something that people only deal with 
right after they set up the distro and then they never really deal with it again so we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it so we haven't quite fixed it i feel yeah. like it's that the intention is because, a little different in this one like the way i was used to it is you install the vlc package and it has the h264 codec yeah and, yeah, and then yeah. you just watch the video i, I never had issues. and the vlc I, project has fantastic support for open source so there's even a repo where you can get stable builds of vlc or you can get the unstable builds of vlc and they're automatically updated uh I use I played around with the SUSE build gallery to uh, mm -hmm. create a couple of virtual machines that I'll have linked in the show notes if you guys want to download those. And that 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 open SUSE build gallery or I'm uh, sorry, open SUSE studio, I guess is what it is where you can actually design a machine yep. is a lot of fun. You get this you get this great Ajaxy interface where you can say okay, I want to start with a GNOME open SUSE 121 template. And then I want to add VLC, and I want to add Chromium, and I want to add these repos so I can get the codex. And then once you're all done, you can set a background. Like the ones you guys could download from the show notes, there's a little Linux Action Show logo on the boot screen, and a little Linux Action Show logo up in the corner of Grub and stuff like that. And they let nice. you like kind of personalize it too. And then That's cool. At, yeah, so at the time, by the time I'm done, I have an ISO image of a totally custom-tailored version of OpenSUSE 12.1 for myself that has all the stuff on it that I want. And it's like, wow, I just, I just have this. I just install it, and it's exactly the way I want it. And it's available as a download in ISO or as a VM image. I really like the tie-in there. It, it really makes playing with this distro a lot of fun. So, anyways, uh, I don't know if I got a chance, if, if I didn't show the, uh, the Snapper UI. Here's the, uh, here's the user interface to Snapper where it lets you go through. And you can see in this, in this example they have here, the uh, Snapper program monitored the Etsy directory. And then through like package updates and things like that, the uh, group file and the shadow file and the password update and the password file were updated. And you can go in here and then you can, and, and it keeps iterations of it too. So you can actually right. iterate backwards if like you knew two days ago you had a good file, but yesterday you didn't. Right. Really nice, really nice feature. So the, Snapper and Tumbleweed are, are definitely uh, some of my, my, my favorite features. Uh, the fact that they have good XFCE 4.8 support is really awesome. My two desktop setups that I'm using the most in this are LXDE and XFCE. I tried the GNOME 3.2 implementation. It's, uh, you know, it's GNOME 3.2. 3.2, exactly. It's, it's GNOME just 3 like, If you like that kind of thing, then sure, but otherwise, maybe not. I kind of came to the realization, if I'm going to have a limited desktop experience that does less than I'm used to, why not use XFCE or LXDE? And go like, all the way, right? Because those still have the more traditional computing interface with the menu system that I like, and the, the LXDE menu system, I think, out of all of the desktops on OpenSUSE 12.1, the LXDE desktop has the most logical, least amount of clicks to get to Yast and all that kind of stuff. It's very fast, very efficient. It flies. I mean, why not? If I'm, if I'm going to restrict myself with GNOME 3 and, and have a watered-down, less functional desktop, use one of the alternative desktops. And the yep. fact that they just have one button, click, and you've got it support right in the installer is, is pretty right. cool. And they've actually spent time... You know, um, just most other distros nice. have, have, you know, picked one uh, desktop environment and kind of tied themselves to it. Yeah. Whereas uh, Sousa has taken the opposite approach and been like, well, there's lots of the different ones. Why don't you just use whatever makes you happy? And I'm showing a screenshot of the GNOME 3.2 desktop here. See, the thing is, is there's just not a lot to do with GNOME 3.2. It's just, it's very basic. It's black borders and, and a shell that sits on top of Nautilus with bad icons. And there's just mm -hmm. not. There's not a lot of creativity that can be done there. There's not a lot of branding or individualism that can be done outside of what the distro is already doing. I, the more I review GNOME 3, the, just the, the least I'm wrapping my brain, the less I'm wrapping my brain around it. So uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's really all I have to say about that. But uh, their KDE 4 desktop, like always, OpenSUSE 12.1 has a, a world-class KDE implementation. I mean, one of nice. the best-looking feeling integrated KDE desktops out there has always, in my opinion, been OpenSUSE and they just they continue that tradition right in OpenSUSE 12.1. Um, so, yeah, I, I, right. I, I would also call out, I would say, uh, let's see, I had a couple of notes here. Um, they also supported Chromium. They, you can get Chromium in the repo, which is yep. nice, which is a nice change from Fedora. Oh, oh, geez, yeah, this is what I was trying to remember. WebYast. Right, I was going to ask you about that. So you're familiar with YAST, the yet another system tool that lets you configure and manage just about every aspect of a SUSE box. Everything from your hardware clock to joining a Windows domain to file sharing to setting up Apache. I mean, it's really great. And now, uh, they've been working on it for a little while, but shipping with 12.1 is WebYAST, which you can even set up during the installation 
you can just check a box to get WebYast. And uh, this is on the SUSE uh, Studio too. When you check the box, it automatically just adds the provisions you need to the SUSE firewall because SUSE by default, its firewall is turned on. Whenever mm -hmm. during installation you add a service like SSH or WebYast, th those, the YAST system is intelligent enough to go, okay, well, if they want something that does remote access, I'll let them know too that I'm going to open these firewall ports. Then you can, you can manage a really, think about this. Think about doing like a super lightweight Linux OpenSUSE 12.1 install just on some piece of hardware for, for virtualization mm -hmm. or whatever because they have virtualization tools in YAST too. Right. And then no GUI, but you load WebYAST. You could just let it run there headless, get into mm -hmm. WebYAST. You could manage all of the VMs inside the web GUI. Uh, super yep. slick. I really like that. Um, and if, if you want a good story about what happens when the installer doesn't create the exception in the firewall when you enable the service, uh, I have a good war story on uh, TechSnap this week. about. Oh, that. yeah? Cool. Uh, I was talking to somebody in the chat room uh, about Windows Server Administration, and it brought up an old war story I had completely forgot about. And we'll talk I about look, that. I love one. the war story, so I look forward to that. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that. I think those are the main things that I was, I was impressed by. I would say that in the current crop of desktops, um, my personal opinion is it's going to come down between Linux Mint and OpenSUSE 12.1. Yeah. I think Unity is better, but it's not for me yet. I think Fedora didn't offer enough to differentiate itself from just the generic distributions for a desktop user for myself. Right. Fedora is basically specifically for people that have, are so entrenched in like CentOS or Red Hat Enterprise Linux that they just want the desktop version of that. And, 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 it's, and it's, it's great. That's great for yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's not really meant for everybody else. But OpenSUSE 12.1 is, is a fantastic product. Also, that you can still buy it in the box. They're still offering the box. So if you want to get a big box of Linux software with the books and the CD or the DVDs and all that stuff, you can still do that with OpenSUSE, which is how I w used to get SUSE back in the day. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have used SUSE in many different iterations, including I used it a lot in the SUSE Enterprise Linux. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, what's the SUSE Enterprise Linux? I guess that's just less server. Um, and uh, I've always I've always found it to be a very well thought out distribution. I'll give you an example. I tried to load it on a MacBook last night just for fun to see what would happen. Every distro fails this test because it's one of those MacBooks that has uh, it has like two video cards in it, and one of them's an Intel. So I was hoping, I think, or maybe it's not. I don't know. I don't know how the MacBook's laid out, but I know it has two video cards in there, and distros just they go nuts with this. They just can't handle it. Especially when you have two monitors plugged in. OpenSUSE, though, loads up, detects that it's having trouble with the video, and instead of just bombing out like every distro does for me, it, re it, 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 it drops down to this high resolution, like, like 1600 by 1200 or some very high resolution end curses based setup of YAST. And I'm, I'm presented with all of these options that might be like, check the drive for issues or all of this stuff that's like we figured out that maybe eventually you might run into an issue and now we have this contingency plan you can continue the installer using n curses you can check your drive you can recover a broken installation you can reload off an ftp server over the network if you want we've got you covered you're not screwed and it's yeah. it's like that at at all these different levels from from a beautiful grub menu that matches the boot screen, that matches the login screen, that then matches the desktop login. I mean, it's, yep. it's people are sitting there and thinking about what, a, what kind of product they're making and how they want it to look and what they want it to include. Things like own cloud. It, we've been talking about own cloud on this show. OpenSUSE 12.1 has support for own cloud built in. The mm -hmm. stuff that they really, I think they really get the power desktop Linux user. I think they really get me. And I think... I'm loving, I'm loving their approach here. I, I have nothing but good things to say about OpenSUSE 12.1. I have, I have used a lot of SUSE releases. This is absolutely one of the best. I made fun of them for jumping to 12.1 from the 11 release saying, oh, they're, you know, they don't want to do 12.0 because it's bad, it's bad luck, right? That seems a little silly, but... <laughs> I thought so, I thought so. But you know what? I get it now. They didn't want any of the connotations of a .0 release holding this one back. Mm -hmm. And this... I wonder if this is how all distros would be with an eight-month release cycle. Because this is a pleasure to use because I feel like the people behind it really cared about designing a great experience. And it comes right. through in the product. And mm -hmm. that's what's really exciting about well, OpenSUSE. The whole point behind OpenSUSE at one, or when they reorganized the SUSE project was that it was going to be the desktop to replace Windows for Novell workstations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but 
you know, that's changed around a little bit now, but it definitely seems you can feel that more organized and, and directed development going on there. I'll say this. I'll say, you know, if you're curious to try out OpenSUSE 12.1, I highly recommend the XFCE desktop or the LX... Or I actually... Well, the LXDE Pick desktop, one. I like a lot, but I would say go X, XFCE. The other nice thing, uses Thunderbird as its default mail client. I mean, like, uses yep. all of the apps that you'd almost want anyways as the default apps instead of some of the apps that the GNOME desktop uses or the KDE mm -hmm. one. I think it's a great experience. A couple of links in the show notes if you want to download them and kick the tires. I don't know if they're really production-ready machines. I was just kind of playing around in the, uh, in the SUSE studio, right. but, you know, you, you're more than welcome to try that them. That does all. seem like a cool tool, though, as well. It really is because I could see building a, uh, you know, like if I was if I was working at a data center for you know a company and I wanted a specific role of a distribution for our for our deployment, you can go there. Mm -hmm. The other that nice thing is it's not fixed, it's not permanent. You can add stuff and iterate and release a new rev and keep the old rev, keep right. the new rev, and do release notes and all that kind of stuff. So you could have like an OpenSUSE twelve dot one build up there or in the gallery that maybe six months later you went back to and added a few repos, added more packages, and then just spun a new disk. Right. And, and what's the output like? Is it normally? Is the it like output a of, the, of what you get? You get either yeah. uh, an ISO or a hard drive image file or a v VMDK or um, OSV file, which is like the open virtualization. Um, right. You can get one of those. You know, so you basically get it in every and iteration those, you want. Those can be imported into something like OpenStack yes. right away. And then right. You can deploy that just like you would like an AMI or whatever. Or it can develop, or it can produce a VMDK. You could literally just take that VMDK and throw it in just about any any virtualization suite. Any. Yeah, and you're ready to that go. Definitely I mean, seems cool. Yeah, these guys have really got it figured out. And they also have what I get it confused with all the time is the build service, which lets authors upload their software and then the build service builds it for multiple platforms, which I believe so can then tie in directly to repos. So you can actually subscribe to repos that are populated by the build service. So you can get really really fresh stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and you know, I, the reason why I brought up the fact that I've worked with Slash uh, Linux Enterprise is um, I did that five, six years ago. I mean, I did that a long time ago. And back then, all of the things I appreciated about a well built system, you know, when you work as a system administrator for years with an operating system, you get a feel yep. for a well built system. Like, yep. like, you know, say what you will about free about free BST, but that feels like a very well put together operating system. Yeah, Open SUSE, SUSE feels very much that way. More so yeah. than I would say just about any distro in terms of complete wholeness. It feels like a, a holistic experience, and uh, I, I think it is one of the strongest innovators in the desktop Linux experience. Go check it out. Let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, I hope you love it. Now, I think it's Open SUSE 12.1, like I said, versus the new Mint. That's the next one on my list, I think. I think now I'm going to tear into Mint. Yeah, I think uh, Open SUSE is the one I've from the way you've described is the one that I'm most interested in actually trying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's definitely a very, uh, it's very elegant. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, there you have it. That's the Linux Action Show's look at OpenSUSE 12.1. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Alan, dude, mm -hmm. thanks again for joining me like every no week. I appreciate it. And I want to tell people about the Jupiter signal because you and I were yes. just chatting about this on the live stream and we've had a lot of success. People are excited about the Jupiter signal. That's Jupiter Broadcasting's new monthly newsletter and it should be launching in the first week of December. I'll be using that newsletter to let you know about new shows we're launching, like one that's coming up in just a couple of weeks, as well as other interesting little factoids about shows and the network in general. So you yeah. can uh, Things like, for example, that TechSnap this week will be on Wednesday. The live show will be on Wednesday because Thursday's a holiday. That's right. Uh, a little uh, a little turkey day for me. Mm -hmm. We uh, we had to move last for your turkey day, and now we've had to move TechSnap for my turkey day. <laughs> so yeah, go to, go to bit.ly slash signal if you want to grab that. And also, uh, there'll just be a sign-up form in the show notes of this episode if, uh, if you want to do that. If you're watching the live stream, I just put a link in the uh, IRC chat room. Nice. All right, Alan. Well, you know, uh, I, just have, I guess we should cover a few pieces of business in case people want to give us some feedback. Yep. You can always find us on uh, Twitter. He's Twitter.com slash Alan Jude. Of course, I'm Twitter.com slash Chris LAS. And both of us, as well as the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, are on Google+. Plus. Links to those in the show notes. Yep. Um, Alan, anything else we wanted to cover in this episode? Uh, there's also the Reddit. and uh, That's right. Go to linuxactionshow.reddit.com. And one other thing I'll mention is we've talked a lot about the VLC and the uh, you know, mem player or whatever you want to use to get our live stream now. 
We've also got an audio-only live stream over at jblive.am if you want to yes. stream this, uh, this show or any other show while maybe you're on the car or sitting at your desk at work. The stream goes 24-7. Even when mm-hmm. we're not doing a live show, we'll, we'll, we'll play reruns. And sometimes that's a, just a good way to tune in and just catch up on the last shows of the week because they're usually running on the live stream playlist. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, the Linux Action Show comes out every single Sunday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And even if you can't join us live, you can download it in just about any format you could possibly want. And you could grab an RSS feed to get the show weekly when it comes out. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for watching this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. And we'll see you right back here next week. What show are we doing? Hi everyone, and welcome <laughs> to Cast a Blaster. <laughs> Alright, so Linux action. You are show. literally insane. <laughs>